Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Hello, everyone. My name is Nikos Tsafos, and I'm the Interim Director and a Senior Fellow with the Energy Security and Climate Change Program here at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. And I want to welcome you to today's program on oil and gas uh, investment, the landscape for oil and gas investment. Uh, I'm very pleased to be able to have this conversation where we're going to talk about the ability of the oil and gas industry in the sector, to access capital, what the impact of that ability is on overall investment and whether or not we are getting adequate investment in order to be able to meet uh, demand under different uh, scenarios that we might see over the next sort of 10 years or so. We have a great uh, panel uh, discussion for us today. We're gonna do this in two phases. Uh, first, uh, I will uh, moderate a discussion with uh, Rebecca Fitz, who's a senior director with the Center for Energy Impact at Boston Consulting Group and with Ashley Fernandez, who's a natural resources sector leader and portfolio manager at Fidelity Investments. So us three are gonna talk for about half an hour, and then I'm gonna pass it on to my colleague, Ben Cahill, who's gonna lead a discussion with Scott Sheffield, who's the CEO of Pioneer Resources, and Gretchen Watkins, who's the president of Shell Oil Company. So um, as is usual with uh, CSIS events, uh, please go on our website and where it says you can submit a question, you can fill out that form and the question is gonna come to me and I'm gonna do my best to integrate these questions into the conversation. So let's uh, dive straight into this because we have a lot to talk about. And Rebecca, let me start with you. Um, tell us a little bit about what you see in terms of the level of investment needed over the next, um, you know, eight, nine years to 2030 to meet various demand scenarios. Boston Consulting Group has been doing some work on this. Uh, give us a sense of what it is that you have found in your research. Sure. Um, well, first, thanks for having me on today. Thanks, Nikos. And it's a pleasure to be here to talk about this important topic. So on the question of investment, late last year, my colleagues at Boston Consulting Group and I worked with the International Energy Forum, or the IES to examine the implications of the COVID-induced curtailment in upstream oil and gas investment. So to give a sense of scale here, global upstream spending fell by about 35% in 2020 compared to 2019. So spending has recovered a bit in 2021, but we're still looking at about an $100 billion gap between 2021 and 2019 spend levels. Um, moreover, this report also looked at the fact that these spending cuts are far more meaningful today than they were in 2014 and 2015, when companies were also cutting CapEx rapidly in response to a falling oil price. So in 2014, there was lots of fat to cut, and today there's less. So companies have been taking costs out of their businesses for years and many of the easier project management related cost reductions have been attacked already. So in the future, we'll need more and more innovative technology solutions to chip away at the cost curve. Um, so cost cutting of the scale and impact of 2020 and 2021 will already affect future supply. But looking forward, and looking across varying oil demand scenarios. Given underlying production declines in, in the oil and gas resource space, our models suggest that the industry, well, investment will need to rise about 20% per year over the next three years to starve off a supply shortfall. And then roughly 500 billion and annual capex will be needed by the end of the decade to ensure sufficient production. So when we looked at it like this, we, you know, thinking about it in this way shifts the conversation from a focus on peak demand to whether we're nearing peak investment in oil and gas and the extent to which the industry um, can meet 
future investment requirements. So let me follow up on that because that obviously sort of begs the question. I mean, the, the implication of what you said is that we might be faced with either oil price volatility or a spike in, in oil prices as a result of that. I mean, does that ultimately what, what might be happening here? Um, you know, prices are a result of demand and supply, obviously. Um, when we look at it, there are many unknowns in the oil demand side still, but overall demand looks fairly resilient, particularly coupled with just the need to consistently invest to meet current demand, let alone future demand. Um, but on the supply side, you know, our estimates suggest that the industry needs to spend more overall just to meet this demand. And it's not doing so, so far. Um, as a whole, the sector has a, has a history of chasing up cycles and investor pressure that they not do so today should be a break on how fast spending can increase. Um, and obviously the shale sector is front and center here. If, you, if the investor demand is to invest for returns maximization, this should limit the pace of spending increases. So overall, we think volatility is something to plan for in years ahead. Um, plan for, you know, if you're gonna, if you're expected, if you see 80, plan to see some 40 on the back side of it. So in terms of planning, volatility, volatility is agony from a planning perspective. And volatility forces companies to be very prudent in spending decisions. So when we look at planning decisions, apart from you know, the price environment, um, we think the winners will be the companies that can manage across cycles, not just win up cycles. Ashley, let me turn to you because the Rebecca has teed this up perfectly for you, right? I mean, where you sit a sort of a different vantage point. And obviously one of the things we have seen over the last few years is the demands of the investor community towards the oil and gas sector, whether that is in the form of ESG, and that obviously is a very broad term. You know, how should we be thinking about the ability of this industry to access capital, given the changes that have happened in recent years on the financial side of things? Uh, thank you, Nikos. It's a, it's a good question. I think on, on capital, I mean, we really, we really watch a couple of different buckets of capital into the industry. We look at, you know, public equity. Obviously, we're a large participant in that. We look at private equity. We look at debt. And I can tell you just from looking at our data over the last 10 years internally, the tolerance for investing public equity, you know, doing rounds of financing, into um, energy companies, traditional oil and gas companies is, is quite low at this point. And I don't think it's, um, it's necessarily an indictment of the industry by, by any measure. I think it's more a question of the returns that have been put up over the course of the past decade. And I would echo a lot of um, Rebecca's points in terms of the, the evolution of, of how this has all played out in this question of peak demand versus peak supply. I think it's a, it's a great point and, and it's what everybody should be thinking about. And we just saw, I think over the last 10 years, one of the biggest um, rounds of investment into energy that, that the world's seen in the form of shale. I mean, we looked at this quite in depth at the turn of the year, and we've measured about you know, $800 billion have gone into CapEx and shale. It's a tremendous amount of capital. Um, and, and we were participants in this, private equity was participants in this, like th these were funded by a variety of sources. And, I, I do not think it's it's repeatable. Um, much of this was funded by a lot of ENPs selling international assets. That's one time. The amount of private equity that went into the industry, I don't think is repeatable. We're seeing a lot of PE firms retrench. And then finally, firms like us, you know, put money into, into public companies and IPOs, and that's coming to an end. So I don't think it's repeatable. We can't at all... Um, underestimate how big the impact of that spending was. This, the shale just had a deflationary impact on oil prices. It had a deflationary impact on gas prices globally. It's a tremendous impact. But I think during that whole time frame, something else was happening. If we look to the international markets, the traditional participants were IOCs, international EMPs, and a lot of operational capacity and expertise has been taken out of the international arena. 
And, and, and that masks, I think that will lead to decline rates that, that potentially surprise people. And now as we're exiting this period, ESG is coming to the forefront. And you look at the European oil companies, tremendous amount of pressure on, on how they're spending money and reorienting away from oil and gas. So this goes back to, I think, what Rebecca brought up, which is what really bends over quickly, the supply curve or the demand curve. And, and, and right now, I think consumers' habits change slowly, particularly in countries like the United States, where you know habits die hard and people like large cars. And the supply curve changes in real time. This is happening you know, much quicker. So I think just to wrap it up, I think any investment that we're looking at in oil and gas, and I think this is a function of most other public equity investors I speak with, the formula is relatively simple. It's, I don't know if, you know, a bull would say oil and gas has a runway till 2035 or 2040. A bear would say it peaks in 2026. But regardless if you're a bull or bear, the final chapter has been written. And so you have to think about what your time frame for returns are. And, and I think for us, one way, and I'm not necessarily speaking for Fidelity as a whole here, but you know, I do um, steer a lot of the research, is we're looking for investments where we can get the lion's share of our EV out in 10 years, and we're playing with house money for the 2030s, and that makes sense. That's the way we're looking at it. And, and I think that um, it has to be governed by returns, whether it's you know, something that, that's green or something that's more associated with traditional oil and gas. It has to be generated by returns, free cash flow, and how much cash am I getting back in the next 10 years? Well, thank you. You put a lot of things on the table that I hope we have time to come back to. One of the things that you said was about, especially the European majors, but it's not only for them, capital allocation between sort of the core oil and gas business and new ventures. You know, how are you thinking of, about that? And also, of course, what does that mean for the availability of capital to meet the gap that sort of Rebecca put out on the table? So Ashley, I'm coming to you first, and then Rebecca, I'm going to come to you for that, for, for a take on that question. Yeah, I've, I've always started, Nikos, with a simple question that you ask yourself as an investor. Why do investors own oil and gas companies? And let's just start off with integrated oil and gas companies, because I think it makes it very simplistic. And the, and the, and the disarming answer is very simple. People own them for the dividends. And people own them for their ability to grow dividends. So you start off with that and say, is any investment the company making going to enhance or detract its ability to pay that dividend over the course of a long time frame, five, 10 years? And, you know, I think with the way people are spending money, I, I would observe a couple of things. I think that it's very important. They have a, a lot of these companies generate a lot of free cash flow from legacy assets that were built 10, 15 years ago, um, whether it's a refinery or an LNG plant in traditional oil and gas. And, and, and that's what pays the bill and the bill's the dividend. Um, I think we are, I can say at Fidelity, our push into ESG and, and how quickly it's happened in the last, I'd say four or five years is tremendous. So we're looking at this from all angles and there's nothing that would excite me more if I saw a company investing in a market that serves the energy transition, which has a couple of different ingredients. The first is competitive advantage. The second is scalability. And the third is returns. Those are the three magic things I'm looking for. It's tough to see right now, to be honest. And, you know, I think when you're an oil and gas investor, you look at these um, markets with a, bit of, with, with a bit of a skeptical eye because you're used to CapEx inflation, you're used to delays, you're used to challenges. And right now in some of these emerging markets and you know, maybe offshore winds an, an example of that, the starting point on returns is not necessarily great. And when you layer on steel costs going up, copper prices going up, two or three year delays, um, things becoming difficult with weather in the North Sea, it's hard to paint a picture that there's a lot of room for error. So I think that these companies have to really keep you know, a really close eye on whether or not they're going to generate enough free cash flow from their existing core oil and gas businesses to fund a dividend over a long time period. But I also think they should be investing in the energy transition, but I think they have to be very judicious because I think markets and investors are, are, are relatively smart. And like any other investment, I remember you know, 2010, 2000. 
11, everybody was excited about the LNG market. But as soon as the market got a hint that cost inflation was coming, the, de the stocks derated. And I don't see why that couldn't happen in renewables. So we'd love to invest in this space. We are investing in this space, but we need that trifecta that I spoke with. And just to recap, that's scalability, competitive differentiation, and returns. I suspect some people will be writing that up and printing it and putting it up uh, on their, I guess now we don't really have offices quite yet, but on their future uh, or when they're back in the office, I think that's a great clarity and I appreciate that. Uh, Rebecca, can I get your take on that same question of capital allocation? Yep, I completely agree with Ash, uh, particularly around the, the, you know, the paramount importance of funding the dividend with uh, you know, a fortified balance sheet. And I, I think when you look at the competing capital allocation priorities, it's very clear that reinvestment is a tertiary importance behind dividends, you know, div competitive dividends, uh, a little bit competitive buyback and balance sheet fortification. But I guess when I, when I think about reinvestment in the core versus investment in low carbon energies. I, I would argue um, for some that low carbon is increasingly being seen as core to future value creation. Now, admittedly, we're not there yet with upstream oil and gas in large part funding a transition, but thinking about the concept that Ash just introduced, scalability, competitive advantage and returns, I have been quite intrigued how different companies have really used or taken the, oppor the opportunity coming out of 2020 to relook at where competitive advantage resides in their portfolio. And if you have scalable competitive advantage, do you have a different ability to access returns in elements of the energy transition? And in that sense, you see a real fragmentation of mindset in terms of, is energy is low is reducing carbon emissions merely a risk mitigation action um, that one undertakes, or is low carbon an investment in low carbon in areas where you perceive competitive advantage the key to unlocking future value creation? So I want to I mean certainly the based on dollars today, upstream is core. But based on the flow of dollars into the future, I, 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 I don't know if everyone would define their business as low carbon being non-core. I would suspect many don't. Let me pick up on something that you know, you've both have alluded to, but I wanted to make a finer point on this. I mean, we are faced with obviously what is always a cyclical business, right? And you ask people when the price of oil is 30, how they're feeling, and they give you a very different answer when the price of oil goes to 60 or 70. And obviously we've seen in recent months a significant increase in the price of oil, depending on where you sort of start the comparison. Um, and so I wanted to ask you both, uh, and maybe uh, Ashley, let me start with you. You know, how, how quickly does that oil price increase affect things like the ability to spend money, uh, given all the constraints that we've talked about? I mean. For lack of a better word, is this time different or not? Or, or are we going to go back to, if people see their returns, if the price of oil is high, some of these concerns around ESG or climate or demand kind of go away because you see sort of the returns. How are you thinking about that cyclicality? It's a great question. Um, I'll start off with a simple answer. I think to your question is, do, do I think it's different this time in terms of companies ramping spending? I do think it's different this time. Um, the, however, the second part of my answer is that I'm paranoid it's not different this time um, because you know, you've seen behavior change with, with the oil price so often. Um, just to unpack that a little bit, a couple of reasons why I think it's different. I think it's because firms like us um, you know, are, are very, very focused on this. The, the society is focused on this. I mean, I think we'd all agree that the media scrutiny for all the right reasons and, you know, making the world greener it is rightly focused on this. But I think the mandates of the companies, and we've seen this, you know, I'll go back to Europe because it's really started in Europe. The, the mandates of these companies have changed so much. And, and I think they've reached an inflection point where they can't really move back to 
um, to some traditional investments. You, you take like the European oil companies about, um, you know, 15 years ago when I started on looking at oil and gas at Fidelity, they were investing heavily in the oil sands. I can say with a pretty high degree of certainty, I don't think they're ever going to do that again. I don't think there's going to be a wholesale round two of a huge investment into some of these asset classes. So I think that the pressures from investors, um, political entities, um, the society at large, NGOs has all has very much refocused these companies in a different way. And, you know, we can see the, the shift happening. Um, and, and I think that it, it really manifests itself from technology in some ways. I mean, I think it's really hard to argue that EVs won't be a bigger component of, of, the, of the car stack in the next 20 years. And, and this is based on many, many different things. I mean, you can make the argument like a country like China is trying to finally reduce its dependency um, on resources from foreign entities. Europe might be doing it for the same reason, but maybe a little bit more because of a moral conviction around becoming more green. But regardless of the reason this is happening in real time, energy companies um, are noticing this and, and they're changing. And, um, and I don't think it's reversible, but I think that when it comes back to, you know, how we invest and how we look at it, investing, it really comes down to this other question, which I brought up um, in earlier comments is, does this mean that it's going to be good for prices or, or bad for prices? I think that, you know, I, I do think every time I read an article in the Wall Street Journal, it makes me feel like oil's finished forever. Every time I go back to the spreadsheets and, and the analysis I do, it tells me the supply curve will fall over quicker than the demand curve. And we're going to get a very atypical, but, but, but a cycle of some sort um, as companies just retrench investing. Um, so I do think it's changed. I think that what's happening in Europe, and we can see that it's starting to happen, maybe not to the same degree, but it's happening in the United States um, and Canada. And um, it's manifesting itself through some of these changes in behavior in some of the largest companies in, in North America when it comes to energy. So I think it's, it's different and it's changed. Rebecca? Um, you know, I, I agree. I think in the case of just the EMPs, it, it's clear, you know, if we look at share price performance year to date, that a higher prices are attracting back investors, but it's not clear that that's sufficient over time and in the longer term. And what becomes more, more important is demonstrating capital discipline and development of credible ESG and carbon reduction efforts. That's what's required to keep investors over the longer term. So, you know, company plans need to interact with what investors want and, and also with what regulators want. And we've seen changes happening here. So I would, I would hope that price signals are just one signal to corporate behavior. And many of the other signals out there are changing and navigating that is, is the key to future success. Um, when it comes to the largest IOCs, I mean, it's very clear that high, a higher oil prices is obviously good for their financial framework. But if we consider the, the scale of changes some of the largest IOCs have introduced over the past year in terms of their capital allocation framework, in terms of some of the commitments they've made longer term around carbon emissions reduction and, and net zero ambitions, um, they're committed to their low carbon ambitious ambition, uh, ambitions for future value creation. So even with higher prices over time, I, I think it's hard to sell for these companies um, a massive swing in capital allocation patterns over the next several years, given, given how new commitments were rolled out. And going back to a point Ash made, you know, there's a lot of calls on capital. And in a sector that has had a good couple months, but a really challenging decade or more in terms of share prices, you know, shareholder payout is a critical call in capital. Um, and balance sheet fortification um, for future cycles is a critical call on capital. 
And I think in terms of changing corporate behavior, um, these are going to be more pressing areas of concern over a reacceleration in reinvestment capital. Thank you for that. We only have about. Oh, Ashko. Oh, sorry, I forgot to add on to, to one thing. Rebecca, I'm jogging my memory, but it, it's an important point. For the first time in, in 15 years, companies are getting rewarded for not spending money. I mean, th that is something that has never happened before in this industry. We're currently doing a bit of a quantitative study. You never really know where these go, but um, it, it's really borne by the fact that us and the rest of my team are, are looking at it. And, it's quite clear that in capital markets over the course of the last, I'd say year, particularly in the last six months, companies which are boosting dividends and keeping CapEx flat, are, the stock prices are reacting outsized relative to those which aren't doing that. And we've seen this very, very recently. So I, think, I just think it's an important thing to think in oil and gas with that final chapter being written as I, as I keep on saying, um, companies will be rewarded for not spending money, which is a very powerful feedback loop to management teams. Thank you for, for adding that. Um, we only have about three minutes before we pass it over to Ben and the next panel. I wanted to, the title of this discussion is Oil and Gas. And so I, I, I can't resist putting on my gas hat a little bit and asking, to what extent does the story that we've talked about differ between oil and gas, and, and, and is there a differentiation that is meaningful or not? Maybe Rebecca, start, start with you and then go to, go to Ash. Yeah, I mean, I, I you know, because you obviously know gas very well, um, I, I think you still have a bit of a regional market and need to look at regional players. So if you look at the large companies investing in large scale LNG projects internationally, it's hard to see the point, um, you know, it's hard to say all the other points don't apply equally to sanctioning new gas investment. That being said, if you look at energy transition plans, it's clear that crude production for, for the large companies will decline, stagnate or decline. Integrated gas operations into consumer networks is designed to grow. And so you do see a bit more, um, positive with challenges you see a more positive inclination to invest in gas projects going forward than crude but the whole the same commentary on you know don't spend money at all holds here i do what's been interesting to me also is to see the u.s gas players engaging on um you know their own emissions reduction scheme and try to phase out, you know, phase in emissions reduction around methane into forward planning. And I think you do get more differentiated programs there. Final word, Ashley. Um, no, I think gas is, is interesting. I think there, there's a couple of different elements. Um, you know, clearly gas will have to play a role um, for base load power. Its role in, in industry will, will be large for, for some time, um, particularly, you know, I think hydrogen is, is ways off. Um, so it has a, a very flat profile and potentially growing obviously in Asia and places like that. I think Rebecca brings up a good point in terms of don't spend money. Sometimes when oil and gas IOCs are the big players in, in, in LNG or have been for the most part aside from, you know, Qatar and Russia, et cetera, but you know, LNG, and some of these projects are proving to be collateral damage for a lower oil price. And I think it just continues to really pull out this important question is, why is, is LNG still being priced off oil? The relevancy of that link is going to continue to fall over the next 10 years. Um, why should LNG's pricing be tied to the future of the combustion engine? It makes no sense, right? And, and, and that's something that'll have to change over time. I think with gas as always, it's complicated. You're seeing Qatar and Russia assert themselves and taking share in the world, but I think gas plays a role and, and, and you know, the US has become a, such an important place and the, the role of associated gas um, in the Marcellus, you, you're seeing this massive concentration of, um, of, of, of gas production amongst the smaller group of EMPs. And it's incredible to me that so much of the US gas production and the exports that the world now is absolutely dependent on is predicated off five or six players in the Marcellus and five or six players in the Hainesville. It's an incredible thing that's happened, but 
I think I think gas certainly is interesting and has an important role. But as always, it, it continues to undersell itself in some ways in the way it's priced, I think. And it, it should have been penetrated much higher in some ways over the last 10 years. But I will leave it at that. Well, Rebecca, Ashley, thank you both. That was a fantastic uh, opening. We covered a lot of ground in just 30 minutes. Uh, thank you both for, for being here. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to my colleague, Ben Cahill. Ben. Hi, everyone. I'm Ben Cahill. I'm a senior fellow in the Energy Program at CSIS. And it's my pleasure to kick off the second panel, um, which is designed to bring in some of the corporate perspective on these big macro trends in the industry and issues like access to capital. Uh, and we're really fortunate to have uh, two terrific speakers join us for this panel. Uh, we have Scott Sheffield, who's CEO of Pioneer Natural Resources, and the largest independents in the United States. And we have Gretchen Hawkins, who's president of Shell Oil Company, and heads up Shell's integrated business in the US. And what we're hoping to do basically is talk about some of these, um, how companies are grappling with these big trends around access to capital from a corporate planning perspective. So we're really grateful to both of them for joining us. We're in the midst of, of earnings season, so. It's a very busy time for all the companies, uh, but we really appreciate your uh, being here with us today. Um, I'm going to start with Scott, and I'll probably kick this question over to Gretchen as well. Uh, we heard in the first panel about some of these concerns that you know the, the pressure for capital discipline for the industry could be leading to underinvestment. And Scott, I was hoping you could talk a little bit about you know, your views on this. Are, are companies caught in between this this very clear mantra of capital discipline in the short term? and some of the broader concerns over the longer term that the industry might be underinvesting in future supply. How's a company like Pioneer grappling with that? Yeah, Ben, it's good to see you and participate. Say hello to Gretchen. Good to see you again, Gretchen. Um, but the I wouldn't use the word caught, first of all. You have to realize, if you go back over the last 10 years, uh, if you just look at our stock price, our stock price is flat. You look at most independents and even the majors, their stock is either flat or down. So everybody knows we're the worst performing industry in the S&P 500 over the last 10 years. So something had to change. And so <clears throat> I was proactive when I returned in 19, I got with the top 30 investors that owned our stock at that time. I talked to others and tried to come up with a new model. And that's the free cash flow model. Most other industries uh, trade off free cash flow. Our industry trades off EBITDA, or the majors trade off earnings. So something had to change. So we changed. If you read a, a, a recent um, Embarus report, uh, it, they highlighted Pioneer and I couldn't confirm, but I'm sure their numbers are right. Uh, we spent 133% of our cash flow the last 10 years and we grew 25% a year. And so, and we basically held our stock price flat. But you got to realize we went up and down. Uh, we experienced lows and highs on that stock price. Uh, and we went through two, uh, three, three down cycles, 11, uh, or 2009, 2014, and then, of course, last year. So something had to change, and that was really only spend about 50% of our cash flow to grow 5% a year for the next several years uh, with our large inventory in the Permian, uh, and then return most of that cash flow back to the investors. So we've committed to return 80% of our cash flow back to the investor. Now, you asked what happens if we get caught in a cycle where there's a shortage. We are probably moving into very, once demand comes back, say by 22, 23, we get jet fuel demand. Uh, there is no shell to save everybody uh, like it did in 2014 or 2019 where we grew over a million, million and a half barrels a day. But that's what created the two price wars. And so <clears throat> the big question is, is where demand is going. But I don't think the U.S. shell industry will ever recover to its peak of, you know, roughly 10 million barrels a day or U.S. producing 13. So I wouldn't use the word called. It's what we had to do to, to survive and have investors buy our stocks and, and, and turn it into really a cash flow machine and give most of the cash flow back to the investor. <clears throat> Thanks, Scott. Appreciate those thoughts. And I hope we can spend a little bit more time talking about the, the responsiveness and the cycles in, in the shale sector in a bit. Um, but at this point, Gretchen, I'd love to kick the same question to you and just ask you how Shell is grappling with these issues around 
you know, short-term capital discipline versus you know the medium term and beyond. What's the company's outlook on the interaction between those two? Yeah. So um, first of all, thank you for for uh, having me today. It's good to see you, Ben and Scott. Good to see you again as well. Um, yeah, Shell Shell has recently rolled out um, our financial framework that really sort of looks out into the future of, of the energy transition that, that we're right in the middle of right now. Um, and so we do see some, some shifts taking place over time, um, even, even in, the, in the sort of very near term. So for example, um, in, in 2019, we actually spent about $10 billion in our upstream. Um, and last year we only spent $7 billion of capital. So um, we are looking at over time, um, a, a reduced amount of CapEx in the upstream uh, right now, we're saying sort of six to eight billion dollars um, going forward in the next few years, and we're starting to increase the amount of capital that we're spending in our growth businesses, which is really where our new energies and our renewables are um, this year and going forward between two and three billion dollars. Um, of course, what needs to happen is that uh, we need to continue to um, be one of the top uh, cash flow companies, uh, IOCs out there. Um, and in fact, we just released our results, as you mentioned. Um, and we were able to take quite a big step forward in terms of reducing our debt. Um, we're reducing it once we get down to $65 billion, we're looking at you know, a fairly sizable um, return to shareholders, whether that's through a dividend increase or share buybacks. And so um, that is a, a, a big focus of our company. And I think we actually feel pretty confident um, that we can continue to generate top level cash flows as a company while still having some money to reinvest in uh, what, what is really the growth of our company um, around uh, uh, renewable energy, but also continuing to, 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 you know, to, to focus on um, what we call transition, uh, which is chemicals and, and LNG. And so um, very, very simply, our portfolio is broken into those three pillars. So we have the upstream uh, where we continue to invest significant capital, but also get significant returns. The transition businesses, which are our LNG businesses, again, big return businesses, but also investing there. Of course, we've got a big project in Canada right now in the LNG space, our chemicals business, um, and then the, the, the growth businesses, which will ramp up over time as the energy transition um, continues. Thanks, Gretchen. Well, let me, let me stay with you for a minute and ask a related question, which is about Shell's net zero target. So, Shell has a very ambitious net zero target. It's been very vocal about it. Um, you've written about this and spoken about it yourself. I'm just curious how Shell is, is managing you know, this long-term uh, message that the company has set out with uh, what the implications are for some, some of the short-term decisions. I'm thinking, for example, of you know, spending on the core oil and gas business and especially in exploration. You know, in this industry, we have deep water projects, we have inter integrated gas projects, a lot of these things they're long life projects that take several years from you know, expiration to production. Um, as you think about managing these different parts of the business, how does Shell's net zero target and the long-term vision for the company um, affect some of its short-term thinking? Is there a concern that you might be missing out on some you know, short-term opportunities? You know, how, how do you manage the, the long-term and the short-term concurrently? Yeah, so you know, I really believe in a moment like this, um, it's both countries and companies that need to have uh, net zero targets. And so sure enough, uh, Shell does have one. We, will, we have committed to being net zero by 2050 uh, in step with society. And uh, of course that does have an impact on, on both our capital allocation as we just talked about, um, but also on, on overall sort of how we're running our business. Um, I would say that uh, we don't have a step-by-step -step plan to get there. Um, and so um, we have set some both short-term and mid-term goals for ourselves um, in a couple of different areas to enable us to get there by 2050. Um, for example, uh, we've committed that by 2025, all of our operations will be um, less than 0.2% um, methane um, uh, emissions. And that is a, a, you know, something that we take very seriously. And uh, you know, I personally have been part of working on projects that are aiming to get us there. Um, my compensation is also actually based on that. And, and so is a, a, good, a good number of the Shell staff um, based on emissions reductions and overall net carbon footprint reductions. 
Um, net carbon footprint is another thing that we've got, I would say, sort of short-term and midterm goals. So for example, this year, we are committing to reduce our carbon footprint by two to 3% over our baseline in 2016, next year, three to 4% and so on and so on. Um, and that's, that's not, again, um, an insignificant uh, a, a, you know, amount of effort that goes into that. And just to give you a sense of when I say that, what do I mean? Um, you know, for example, I'm, I'm in addition to my role as president of Shell in the U.S., I have uh, accountability for our global shales portfolio. And um, we've spent a good part of our uh, time in the last uh, 18 to 24 months actually going through um, our, our well sites and replacing high bleed uh, pneumatics with, uh, with low bleed or no bleed. Um, and really looking at places where we can e e reduce or, or eliminate, in, in most cases, our methane emissions. Um, we also were the first company to get approval from the FAA to fly uh, drones with uh, infrared cameras and detection um, equipment on them outside the line of sight. And so we now actively, as does a, a, a number of other industry um, operators, use that equipment to go out on a much more regular basis than we were able to in our cars um, and look for leaks and look for um, places that need, need to be addressed very quickly. And we're able to address those much more quickly um, than we used to be able to. And so I would say, um, you know, overall, we have a, a combination of both short-term, mid-term and long-term, um, but, uh, and, and I'm sure because this is such a dynamic space, um, we'll have, you know, more, We'll, we'll be learning as we go and we'll make more uh, progress as we go year on year. Thanks, Gretchen. Yeah, it's interesting to hear also companies are implementing some of these technology-based solutions to look at issues around leakage and fire and fugitive emissions. Um, Scott, let me turn back to you. Uh, and I'm hoping you can bring in perspective here as you know, I had one of the biggest shield companies in the US. This is a very cyclical industry. It's a very boom and bust industry historically. Um, I think one of the hallmarks of the U.S. shale sector, too, is that then it is so responsive to price signals. Uh, it's very hard to predict where it's going to go because within the space of a, a couple months, capital's decisions made by companies can, can have a visible impact on production. But I'm curious about your perspective on where we are headed into the second half of this year and beyond. Um, do, does the industry in the U.S., the shale sector, still have this kind of responsiveness to price signals? Are we going to see a rapid enough response to avoid this kind of like bust to boom cycle in prices um, and repeat some of the cycles of the past? Yeah, Ben. In fact, one of the uh, first comments I neglected in my first um, discussions, you sort of got to look at start with um, Saudi Aramco. Uh, they're becoming a free cash flow machine themselves, too. They've committed to distribute $75 billion a year of dividends. Now, most of those, they only have 1% that's owned by the public, but the rest of it's going to be going back into their sovereign wealth fund into the, uh, um, into the country to diversify away from oil and gas. And so <clears throat> we're creating all these cash flow machines. The IOCs, including Gretchen's company, Shell, they're making a strong commitment toward uh, uh, <clears throat> away, moving away from fossil fuel investments and long lead items into um, alternative energy. Then you couple that, then you come down to the U.S. shell industry, and we basically have changed our model. And in, in understanding the model of the last 10 years, when we ended up growing during high oil prices, we end up adding too many rigs. We grow too much. We're all competing against each other because we all want the highest stock price. And compensation was paid on growth, reserve replacement, and, and, and growth, which has all changed. And then all of a sudden we saw service cost up 50%, 75%. And so it, when you look at, I've been through six downturns. When you look through the, the downturns <clears throat> is actually the best time to be investing. Uh, and I, I, I had three downturns in my first 30 years in the industry. I've had three in the last 11 years. And one of the biggest things that investors have told me <clears throat> is that we don't have price stability in our sector. And we need price stability, uh, less volatility <clears throat> to bring investment back into our industry. And so let's say we get back up to $70, $80. I do expect next year 
say we get past 70, move into the $80 range. I've made a commitment for Pioneer. We will not grow more than 5% a year. So we will not increase our CapEx. Now, some <clears throat> investors will say that some independents will break that pledge. They'll break the pledge. Uh, but right now, a couple companies have come out and said they're going to grow 10% in 22, and they were punished. Their stock was punished. And so <clears throat> as long as the investment community punishes its companies, now then you ask yourself, let's say demand really gets back to 102, 103, 104 million barrels a day, much quicker than everybody expects. So then what happens? And so what should happen is supply, typical supply demand, if the price gets too high, it may get to 80, it may get to 100, then demand should fall off. At least it's better to have demand uh, cause the price to fall. Uh, people start, stop using as much of the product versus too much supply. Too much supply is what causes these downturns. Uh, the downturns, you have 100, 100 billion of bankruptcies. So that's what I would like to prevent. So I'm hoping for price stability. Uh, and I'm still confident that as long as we have decent uh, politics uh, and risk profiles of the Middle Eastern countries, they still have great rock and they can add more production if needed. The question is, will they do it themselves? Will they allow Western companies to come in, whether it's Iran, Iraq, Kuwait, and Saudi? That's the unknown question. But U.S. Shell, I don't think we'll ever again add a million barrels a day per year. That's great, thanks. Um, Gretchen, maybe I could turn to you quickly to get your response. Uh, you mentioned that you have kind of a dual role and you're in charge of the integrated shale center for, for Shell as well. So when you think about Shell's U.S. business and, um, in the unconventional space, how is Shell thinking about these things right now in the planning cycle? Um, so a pretty positive quarter. Things are looking up, but you know, in terms of planning for the, the second half of 2021 and beyond for the U.S. business, how is Shell thinking about the health of the upstream sector um, and, and spending in the U.S.? Yeah, I mean, I, I'll actually echo a lot of what, what Scott said. I, I do think that the shales industry has gone, um, has, has, uh, has shifted uh, the way we're looking at uh, the business. And for many, many years, uh, the, the focus was really on growing production. Um, I now think the focus has really clearly shifted to growing cash um, and, and free cash flow is, is, is much more uh, the name of the game. It's a much more prudent way to run a business, to be honest with you. Um, and as Scott uh, talked about, you know, there are a lot of companies that have folded um, given the, uh, the high volatility of the markets over the last few years and, and over the last year in particular. And so, um, you know, we're very much uh, a value over volume um, investor uh, in shales and frankly, in the upstream in general, that's really what we're looking at. Um, not, not out chasing barrels, but really out chasing value and, and chasing cash. Um, I think uh, the other thing that you've seen um, just quite recently is that there's been a, a lot of consolidation, particularly in the Permian Basin. Um, I, think, uh, I think that speaks to the, the consolidators that you're seeing are, are, are you know, really looking to, to carry forward that sort of value over volume mantra. And so I think that... Um, the industry will be less susceptible to creating some of this, uh, this volatility, but the markets, of course, um, no one knows what that's going to do. <laughs> one of those aspects of volatility is costs and costs in the service sector. Um, and Gretchen, maybe I'll stick with you for a minute if you don't mind. I, I wanted to get your perspective on how much um, cost can be squeezed farther. Uh, Rebecca mentioned in the first panel that the industry has really cut a lot of fat in this downturn. Um, it's become much more disciplined about its spending. Just curious about your thoughts about the potential for service sector cost inflation. Um, and when we look at CapEx figures, maybe you can just walk us through how much you think each CapEx dollar accomplishes today versus where we were a couple of years ago. Yes, so I, I would agree with, uh, with you and with Rebecca. I think the industry has gone through a, a real um, uh, <clears throat> you know, cost evolution. Uh, and we are now at a place where we're able to produce um, not only safely and more reliably, but at much lower cost than we were just a few years ago. Um, and, and one of the ways that we at Shell have really focused on that is, is actually 
um, not only looking for efficiencies and you know higher capital efficiency, but also looking at ways that um, some of the investment we want to do on the on the environmental side can actually be a win-win. And so um, a couple of examples come to mind. Uh, the first one is you know in the Permian, uh, what it used to be up until a few years ago that we would drill a well, we would put in some equipment for that well, including a flare stack, and then we would move on and drill another well and put some equipment in a flare stack. Um, you know, as of about 24 months ago, we no longer do that. We've engineered out um, about 30 flare stacks into one. And so we've actually now got a much smaller footprint. It costs us a lot less. We drill a number of wells. We pipe them all into what we call a central processing facility. So 30 wells come into one and we have one flare stack. And so we no longer actually have as many um, as many flares as we used to. Um, the flares are really we've uh, we've accomplished. Um, we have zero routine flaring now in the Permian um, across all of our operations, and so flares are only used. What that means is they're only used in in the case of an emergency upset of the system of some sort. Um, and we've also you know that's also sort of driven a high level of capital efficiency um, from from where we were previously. Um, another one to sort of branch out from shales into the deep water space. You know, we've got a, um, a deep water uh, project that's uh, that, that's coming on stream called Veto. And and when we first put that together and designed that and engineered that, um, we said, you know, this is this is too costly. We don't know how this is going to work. Um, over the course of a few months, we actually engineered out by using much more standard design about seventy percent of that initial capex cost. And so. I do think you know the, the industry has gotten much more creative, and frankly, it's the creativity. If you push that aside, much more standardized, um, and that's where you can actually see a lot of these, um, a lot of the, the the costs really coming out. I would say, maybe in addition to that, um, you know, we we continue to think or anticipate um, that we're going to be required um, through regulation or through policy. Um, to show that not only are we more efficient, but that our efficiencies also result in lower emissions or other environmental improvements. Um, and so, you know, that's really kind of a, um, you know, a, another lens, let's put it that way, that we look through when we think about capital efficiency. Thanks. Um, Scott, let me turn to you. Um, so Pioneer is a massive player in the Permian. It's getting bigger now through a couple of recent acquisitions. Maybe you can talk us through how getting bigger and achieving more scale helps a company like Pioneer manage costs. Are you seeing improvements as you get bigger, able to negotiate better deals? Was that part of the rationale for, for seeking to grow in the Permian, uh, managing costs better? Yes, Ben, it, it started us having a great balance sheet. So if we didn't have a great, one of the best balance sheets in the industry, uh, which helps your stock price, it helps where your stock trades. We couldn't have made the two transactions that we did. So it starts with those. We focused on uh, primarily the Midland Basin, um, partially got us into the Delaware Basin. We have about 100,000 acres now in the Delaware. Uh, Delaware has much higher oil cut. Uh, we're all, we are putting rigs to work in the Delaware here shortly, uh, but we focused on contiguous acreage in the Midland Basin. Uh, we have almost a million um, acres now in the Midland Basin. We have about 25% of the rig count of the frack fleet count. So it, it allows us to uh, achieve greater efficiencies, negotiate better prices. Also, a couple of unique things we found out recently is that Parsley was drilling 15,000 foot wells. Uh, Pioneers only drilled maybe 12.5. And so we picked up the Parsley rigs and now we've drilled seven 15,000 foot wells. And we've reallocated, um, looked at all of our acreage, both on double point and on parsley. And we see tremendous benefit by going out 15,000. When we first started drilling horizontal wells, it was 5,000. Then we went to 7,500. And now we're going out to 12,5 and now to 15,000. So if you look at an, an acreage map, we have essentially most of the acreage in the Midland Basin, it's all contiguous. And so it allows us to drill these 15,000 foot wells, which uh, tremendous cost savings in that regard. Also uh, an, a new technique uh, that everybody is trying is simulfrac. Simulfrac is fracking two wells at the same time. 
And so we're seeing tremendous efficiency gains uh, by doing that also. Uh, and so, but the main point that we look for is accretion to our shareholders. So both transactions were double digit accretion on a per share base. It means we can increase our dividend back to those shareholders, uh, including Pioneers and the two companies that we just acquired. Uh, so that, that's the main driver. It's not about getting bigger or growth. It was a really very accretive transactions on a per share base, but they have tremendous synergies. We have over a half a billion a year in synergies that we're achieving on both transactions. Great, thanks, Scott. Um, I want to turn now to back to the, the core question that we're seeking to answer here, which is really about how investor demands in the industry have changed and evolving. Um, and with the rise of the ESG movement and the long-term skepticism about uh, oil demand, there have been some portrayals of the oil industry as you know, a terminal value industry or a sunset industry. And Gretchen, I wanted to get your perspective on how this is affecting cost of capital for Shell and how you expect that to evolve in the future. Maybe you could also talk a little bit about any differentiation you see in cost of capital between the renewables business or low carbon energy and the core oil and, oil and gas business. Yeah, so I think, um, you know, we have a, a net zero target by 2050, but that doesn't mean that in 2050, we won't be producing any hydrocarbons. Um, in fact, we, we believe the world will still need hydrocarbons in 2050 and probably far beyond that. Um, and, and they'll need them for a couple of different things, I think. And uh, so we look at our, um, our investments in the upstream right now in ways that take into account um, that the world needs today hydrocarbons for transportation, maybe not in several decades as much. Um, but the world also needs hydrocarbons today and will continue for things like chemicals. Um, so we're, one of our biggest investments um, in the country right now is, a, is a, the Pennsylvania chemical plant. It's actually one of the largest infrastructure um, projects in, in the whole country. Um, and we will be making um, chemicals there that will go into um, making medical devices, um, making parts for cars that make them more efficient because they're lighter. Um, all sorts of different uh, things that the world will continue to need uh, chemicals for, particularly when you think about energy efficiencies. Um, the other thing that I think is gonna play a huge role going forward are um, technologies like carbon capture and sequestration. And so when you think about net zero, uh, that takes into account that there will be some, some technologies that will be capturing carbon that will still be emitting. And so, um, we're watching very closely, um, you know, what, what sort of policy um, uh, discussions are going on right now in, in Washington, D.C., particularly as part of this infrastructure bill that may enable some uh, more capital investment to go uh, towards things like carbon capture and sequestration. Um, I would say the other thing I would, I would say about that is that we very much still see natural gas. Um, and investment in natural gas being something that, uh, that we will be putting our capital towards. Natural gas very much plays a role in terms of, uh, of, of a being a transition fuel. Um, and in fact, as many people know, I mean, we've taken, I think over the last 15 years or so, the, the emissions from our power plants in the US have declined by some 40 plus percent, really because of a switch between coal and natural gas. And so um, the, the important part about natural gas is that you really need to have your methane emissions under control for that to continue to really make sense. And so, um, as I was saying before, we have very strong targets around that. Um, I guess maybe last but not least, um, you know, we really think about, again, you're, you're asking about cost of capital, and I think we're, we're looking at that um, not in terms of cost of capital so much as sort of the longevity of the investment and how it pays out and when it makes an impact and how we're working ourselves in terms of that, uh, capital um, allocation through this transition. Um, but, but, but the other thing that we certainly um, you know, take into account is um, working very closely with our customers so that we understand the demand for these low and no carbon products. As we start to invest in new things like wind and solar, where we're already investing, but we will be increasing our investments um, we're looking for customers that want uh, uh, energy that's generated um, through renewables. And uh, there's actually quite a few investors out there. Um, and so, for example, 
we're the second or third largest power um, trader in, and power um, buyer and seller in North America. And about a third of the power that we buy and sell is renewable power. And so we have customers, um, frankly, like Amazon and Microsoft that have their own uh, net carbon footprint uh, reduction targets that come to us and say, can you help us? Um, by providing us with a portfolio that, that uh, is mostly or, or all renewable energy. Um, so again, I would think, uh, I, I think um, you know, a couple of different aspects there and sort of completing that with this sort of customer focused uh, end of, uh, of how we think about capital. Scott, let me turn to you with the same question. Just want to get your perspective as an independent oil producer. Uh, are you concerned that lots of sources to cap of capital to the industry, institutional investors and others uh, are going to be increasingly saying no because of ESG requirements and other guidelines. Are you worried about cost of capital moving forward for the company? No, I'm not. I'm not concerned. There has been a movement of some investors moving out of fossil fuel stock. I think the largest investor that we've had, uh, I know they still own uh, over 60 percent of Equinor and they, they kept their investment in the majors, but they sold essentially every independent around the uh, world was the uh, Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund, uh, Norges, but uh, we've seen uh, no effect in regard to investment, but we have to be, we, we have to be responsible, great stewards of the environment. And that's when, when I came back two years ago, I focused on methane like Gretchen and her team in the Permian Basin have done a super job. They helped supported our push toward uh, methane reduction uh, because it was a black eye for the second largest oil field in the uh, world, the Permian Basin. Um, you know, we're up to four and a half million barrels a day, and we were flaring um, close to uh, one BCF a day about two years ago. It's down to about 200 million a day. We still need to get, get everybody under 1% or even less down into the 0.4. We're at 0.4. I think Gretchen says they're at 0.2. Uh, so we need to get everybody way below 1% and take the, uh, the methane question off the table. But we have an interesting chart that shows, that shows the uh, Permian barrels on our slide deck uh, back toward the back that shows we're probably, when you look at um, CO2 emissions, it's one of the lowest in the world, it's sweet crude. Uh, and as long as you have the right practices, like Gretchen said, uh, uh, non-routine, uh, only on upstarts can you um, flare, only on special circumstances, as long as you have policies and have low flaring intensity and venting philosophies, then I think we'll end up making the Permian one of the best places. And the reason we're focused there because we have the lowest break even price. We advertise our break even price is about $28 a barrel. So we can, for 20, so crew can be $28 for the next 10 years. We can keep production flat. If it's $32, then uh, we can pay the dividend, the base dividend. And so we're operating at such, so if IEA is right and we're down to 65 million barrels a day by 2050, then we think the Permian is still gonna be producing at that point in time. It's still got huge potential, but we need to take this issue of flaring and venting totally off the table. And that's why we support all the actions that Gretchen has mentioned, that we have mentioned in regard to flaring. Uh, but I don't think uh, the cost of capital, as long as you're a great producer and a great steward of the environment and produce low CO2 emission barrels and MCFs, I don't think it's going to affect our cost of capital. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I think collective action by the industry to get on top of the methane and flaring issues is definitely welcome. Some people would argue that it's, it's long overdue, but it's good to see that there's a lot of action in recent months on that. Um, we've got about 10 more minutes for questions. Uh, we do have some that have come in from the audience. Um, let me start with you, Scott. One, one question is about how much concern you have about you know, the outlook for the shale sector writ large. Um, given the traditional depletion rates, very rapid drop off in, in, in initial production, um, and the kind of conveyor belt nature of the industry, how concerned are you about how much continued investment we need, even to stay at 11 million barrels a day? Forget about returning back to the days of 13. Uh, how concerned are you about the kind of underlying decline rates? Uh, what has happened uh, as you drill a, a number of wells, we have over 2000 wells now, as you build up and you enter the period 
where the first wells we drilled back in 2012, they're at a very low decline rate. The wells drilled in 13, 14, 15, they're supporting a new base. And so by us lowering our growth rate to 5% a year, uh, we're actually lowering our overall decline, natural decline rate. So it used to be up in the 40s. If we made no investment, we used to decline at 40%, 45% per year. It's moving down toward 30%. And over the next three or four or five years, it should move even lower because you're building up this great base of lower decline wells as wells get older. Uh, so you were, the U.S. is producing 11, you know, two millions from Gulf of Mexico, a million's probably uh, conventional. And so we're probably down to about eight. I'm confident we can keep the eight flat, maybe grow it a little bit. Permian will be the only growing shell basin in the U.S., in my opinion, in regard to oil. Uh, the rest of the basins will be declining. So I sort of expect flattish shell production over the next several years. Um, Gretchen, we had a question come in from the audience on potential new financial instruments and sources of finance available to oil and gas companies, especially to fund some of the low carbon investments, things like um, green bonds, transition bonds, sustainability linked credit facilities. Do you think as Shell grows this part of the business and expands in different areas, there'll be a potential to leverage some of these new sources of finance? I do, and, and, and like I said um, earlier, we're watching very closely, and in fact, not just watching, but, but actively participating in conversations with uh, lawmakers at the moment, um, and, and really are quite hopeful that we'll see something coming through um, that looks like a price on carbon, for example, uh, where in a very even playing field way, uh, you know, we would have um, a, a carbon market uh, that would actually attract capital to things like carbon capture and sequestration. Um, you know, for, for those of you in the audience that are um, interested, we, Shell has for decades actually um, uh, written uh, scenarios that basically are um, economically possible, technically possible ways that the world might evolve, um, you know, looking through a certain lens. And, and in particular, most recently, um, around how we could, as a world, meet the, the, the goals of the Paris Agreement of a 1.5 uh, degree increase. And um, we've just in December launched one for the U.S. And uh, because I, I would go to Washington and I would meet people and say, we've got this great scenario. And they would say, you know, I really feel like I'd love to see one for, for the U.S. So we have one now. And, and one of the interesting things is that there's just no way that the U.S. or frankly, the world can meet the goals of Paris without, without technology like carbon capture and sequestration at a very large scale. Um, and right now here in this country, various countries do have, have carbon markets that allow uh, an investment there to have a, at least a bit of a return. We don't have that here. Um, and so I'm hopeful that, that we do see some of that coming because I think, um, I think frankly, there's quite a bit of capital um, kind of ready and waiting for, um, for those types of investments. Thank you. Um, Scott, let me turn to you uh, and ask a question about policy. Um, I'm sitting in Washington, D.C., so I can't resist the temptation to ask something about what do you make of the, the, the new government and especially the oil and gas policies that the Biden administration is putting into place? So we've seen a temporary moratorium on new oil and gas leasing, um, potential action on things like social cost of carbon rules, um, a lot of questions about how drilling permits will be approved in the future and whether or not the pace of that will be affected. Talk to us a little bit about your perspective on the new policy direction from the Biden administration. I know a lot of this is still unfolding, it's early days, but um, are you concerned about you know, the future of uh, oil and gas leasing on public lands um, in areas like the Delaware Basin, um, New Mexico, where you know, public lands make up a pretty large chunk of, of onshore production? What's Pioneer's some reactions and thoughts on this? Yeah, the, from a personal standpoint, uh, it makes Pioneer's acreage much more valuable because we have no federal land. So, uh, but from a personal standpoint, and I spent a lot of time in Santa Fe, New Mexico, is that I think it's, it's a policy to import more oil from OPEC because what's going to happen is that the majors long-term are not going to commit to long-term investments in the Gulf of Mexico 
if they keep a moratorium on or if they stop giving permits. Uh, it's going to hurt uh, Wyoming. It's going to hurt places in North Dakota. And it's going to definitely hurt the state of New Mexico. Um, and so uh, that's point, point one. Um, on the plus side, um, I know Shell was also with Gretchen's help, but we supported the rollback of the uh, Trump, of the methane emissions in 2016. So we supported the recent um, CRA and came out publicly in that regard. So on the plus side, that was a good thing on the acreage side. So we're, now we're waiting on what happens to intangible drilling cost. And so intangible, most majors capitalize. IDs, they don't take the IDC and expense it right up front, but it's an important item for 10,000 independents, the intangible drilling costs. So they've talked about rolling that out and, and not even let us cost deplete, depreciate our investments. And so that's really going too far. It's gonna be unfair. Uh, so I'm all for alternative investments. I'm all for giving tax credits to solar and wind. Uh, there's gotta be a balance. The oil and gas industry is gonna be here a long time. It's done a great job of giving energy security in the US. And so I'm probably balanced. When it comes to the corporate tax, I think it's I think it's gonna make US uh, uh, not competitive with the rest of the world. If they go to 28%, uh, what's gonna happen, we're gonna end up paying more taxes because we got this free cash flow model now. Uh, dividends are right now are favored. So it's going to help in that standpoint. But in regard to all of us going to 28% corporate income tax, I think it's a big negative for all U.S. industries if they go that far. Thank you. Gretchen, we've just got a couple minutes left, but I'd love to get your thoughts on the same question. What is Shell making the policy signals coming from Washington? Um, maybe a, a two-minute response on, on the big picture from your perspective would be great. Yeah, I, I think... Um... You know, similarly, I, I think uh, we we don't have any um, any federal lands, but we do, of course, have we're the, the biggest operator in the Gulf of Mexico in federal waters, uh, and so um, the, the 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 pause on um, uh, new leases and uh, concern about where that's going um, it doesn't impact us uh, necessarily immediately, but but we very much feel similar to Scott. Um, that, uh, that, you know, these are the, from a, from a energy transition standpoint, these are the lowest uh, carbon footprint barrels you can get <laughs> are, are the ones that are coming from our land and our, our waters. Um, and, uh, and, and it would really be moving backwards if we were to start to import uh, barrels that have had to come over on a ship or a tanker um, and, and so uh, we're, we're working hard to make sure that message is understood because, uh, because we, can't, um, we can't wake up tomorrow and not need hydrocarbons. The world needs energy. And, uh, and right now, hydrocarbons is, 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 uh, is, a, is a huge source of it. Um, I also would, would commend the recent rollback of methane. Scott and I have uh, jo joined forces on that, and we've both been very public about um, wanting to see the um, the the, the uh, methane uh, regulations reinstated, and I think we're on our way towards that. Um, so I would I, I think we're um, you know watching a number of different things, and like I said, hope, hoping also that we see some uh, some policy come around carbon pricing. Uh, we think that would be actually very very good for um, for the economy uh, for the energy transition. Um, and, and lots of lots of different ways. Terrific, thank you. Well, I'm afraid we are just about at time. Um, the industry is dealing with a lot of big issues and, and concerns and a big pivot in uh, investor attitudes, a uh, very complex place. Um, so we're really grateful to all the panelists, to Gretchen, to Scott, uh, and also to Rebecca and Ash for walking us through everything. Um, thank you so much for your time, for all the insights that you shared. And to everyone who joined online, uh, thanks for logging in. Thank you for your questions. Sorry we couldn't get to all of them, but the conversation continues. Have a good afternoon, everyone, and we'll, we'll see you next time.